So what I want to do today is talk about you and your journey to becoming a scientist. Um, so I know, um, based on your description on the Scientifico Latino website, um, that you were born in Peru, you grew up in New Jersey, and you were undocumented um, uh, for over 20 years. Um, and you went through community college, which I think is going to be particularly interesting for my students, um, before you went on to get your PhD, and now you're doing a postdoc. So um, eventually, I do want to ask you about your science, but right now I want to hear about your journey, how you went from Peru to having a PhD in, in science. Oof. I mean, that's a lot. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, I was born in Peru, but I grew up in Elizabeth, New Jersey. So uh, my parents immigrated to, Peru, uh, to New Jersey when uh, I was four and we grew up in Elizabeth, New Jersey. And uh, around that time, I ended up going to Elizabeth High School um, for you know, high school. And I necessarily wasn't like, oh, I want to be a scientist, uh, let alone what can you do with science? Uh, literally in high school, my dream back then was, I want to major in business, I want to go to Rutgers, uh, and hopefully start a business to support my family. So literally, that was my dream in high school. Uh, and my mom uh, pretty much worked full time as a factory worker. So it was my younger brother and me and my dad was in and out of the picture. Uh, so my mom kind of had no reference how college applications worked. So neither did I. So it was roughly, I want to say January or February. Of your senior year? Yes. Okay. And I didn't know that there was a college application deadline. Uh, and I think that's in December, but like uh, no one really told me that. Wow. The guidance counselor never really cared about like people who look like me. So it's kind of like, oh, shoot. like I, I missed the deadline. I didn't know there was a deadline. Like no one told me there was a deadline. So I was like, so there, there was my dreams of like going to Rutgers and going to business school. Mm. Uh, but luckily, I think some somewhere around that spring semester, I want to say maybe February or March, uh, is when a community college representative representative for Union County College stopped by my classroom and he passed out uh, community college application forms. And I was like, oh, this is my chance to go to college. So I remember filling out the form and I noticed that it said um, social security number. Uh, I ended up calling my mom. I was like, mom, what's my social? And she was like, you don't really have one. And that's kind of how I found out what, that I wasn't documented. Or, wow, that's how you so, found out. Yeah or more of like what it means to be undocumented. So I was like, uh, what do I put here? And so I, I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna leave it blank. I submitted my application, you know, and then like a month later, I was like, okay, you're accepted to community college. So uh, I'm, you know, majored in business. I took the relevant classes and it wasn't until my last year of community college where I had a choice of an elective. I either had to take astronomy or biology and biology sounded less intimidating. So I was like, okay, let me take biology. Uh, and this is kind of where like pretty much everything changed. Like this, I guess it's kind of like the first time I'm learning about biology. Just this kind of, this is like, okay, I actually understand what's going on with biology. I'm really interested in back then. I was like really into uh, evolutionary theory. Uh, and I knew I like, okay, I can stay in community college forever. Unfortunately, I need to transfer somewhere. But I, I, long story short, I applied to two Ivy League schools. I applied to Columbia and Brown. And this was because back then uh, there was like, I, I didn't have DACA, I was just undocumented. So I didn't know where exactly I can transfer to. So I applied to those two schools, unfortunately. You didn't apply to any other schools? I, I didn't. You applied uh, to uh, two Ivy League schools? Yeah. <laughs> no other schools? So the reason behind that is because uh, there was a community college uh, uh, pair, a transfer pair, and uh, there were a lot of New Jersey state schools. So I pretty much went to every single New Jersey state school and I was like, look, my GPA is 3.98. I'm majoring in business administration. I did some community outreach through Phi Theta Kappa. Uh, I want to major in biology. Can I transfer to your school? But I'm undocumented. And wow. pretty much every university was like, you can't apply to my school. Wow. You need a security number to apply to my school, or we're going to have to charge you out of state tuition, even though you've been in New Jersey all your life. And for me, I was like, okay, great. I can do state schools. Wow. So that's kind of why like, my only option literally was Ivy's. I actually have a funny story. I, uh, I, in addition to the two Ivy's, 
I, I was unfamiliar with the New York system. So I, in addition to applying to Columbia and Brown, I tried to apply to Barnard and I didn't know that Barnard was an all women's school. <laughs> so <laughs> I, the admissions officer, I, I explained my situation and she was like, I'm sorry to hear that, but like, I'm sorry about your situation, but we're all, all women's school. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, oh, I didn't know that. Wow, that's great. <laughs> and uh, I kind of lucked out because uh, a colleague of mine uh, who was also undocumented, uh, he kind of told me uh, after I got rejected by the Ivy, it's like, I found out about this CUNY system, City University of New York. Uh, they accept undocumented students. You should think about transferring there. And then uh, this is the first time I heard about it. And I was like, I, I need to go somewhere. So I, I, I kind of just transferred to the first CUNY school that I saw and that was Queens College. And uh, back then, because I moved states, uh, I was charged out of state tuition. So I could only really afford one class, maybe two if I was lucky. Uh, so I ended up transferring after a year at Queens College to your college. Uh, but pretty much your college to me was where everything changed. So I ended up taking a biology laboratory course. And one day, one of the professors, Dr. Simon, asked me, have you thought about doing research? And I, back then, I was kind of like, uh, I, I didn't know where exactly that would lead me. So I was like, OK, let me, like, uh, let me, let me, let's set up a time to chat. And pretty much that one conversation pretty much changed everything. I ended up being a student of hers for two years in her research lab. Wow. Uh, and there we kind of uh, published a couple of papers on the social behavior of the fruit fly. So fruit flies, uh, just like us, they have social behavior, except when they're stressed, they release this stress molecules telling other fruit flies to avoid them. Uh, so kind of what I studied was what are the neurotransmitters, chemicals like dopamine or serotonin, that make the fruit fly release this chemical to avoid the other fruit fly. So uh, I ended up uh, doing two years of research on the Dr. Simon and kind of because she invested in me, other professors in the biology department invested in me and even in the physics department. So it was kind of like a domino effect. Mm -hmm. So I kind of learned about Abercam annual biomedical research conference for minority students. And I was able to go there and get a travel award. I never knew what a PhD was. I always thought biology, bio degree, you do a master's and you do uh, a PhD. Uh, but it wasn't until, I think it was a mixture of all those experiences, learning about masters and PhDs. Uh, so I, I applied to a couple of PhDs uh, and I didn't know one that PhDs were paid for. It was like a nice surprise towards after I accepted. Right? I didn't know that either. I was like, are you kidding me? They're gonna pay me for this? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. when I was accepted, I was like, do I take out loans? And I was like, oh, they're giving me a stipend? Uh, so I mean, not a lot, but like, it's better than paying for it. Right. Exactly. Uh, so that was like a really nice surprise. I, uh, I ended up applying to a whole bunch of programs in molecular biology. I want to say six to eight, uh, I got five offers and, uh, nice. I chose the one at Yale, uh, seven years of a PhD program, uh, lots of highs and lows, but, uh, I think overall, uh, it was a good experience. I got a lot of mentors. Uh, I did a lot of diversity and science outreach efforts, and I kind of helped improve the climate uh, over there at Yale by helping recruit 100% scientists and building a community for others like ourselves. Um, so tell me about, I want to hear about your research, and yeah. I want you to explain it like you're telling my grandma. I want, yeah. <laughs> I want my grandma to be able to understand it. I, I always tell my students that also. Uh, let's see. I, I guess I'll do it with my uh, my PhD one. But uh, uh, in short, uh, what we study is C. elegans. So it's a very small nematode. And unlike humans, where we have billions of neurons, this worm only has 302 neurons. So, and you know exactly 300, not 303, oh yeah. 302. Yeah, they, they all have been mapped. We know how every single neuron connects with each other. We know how they communicate. For example, they release chemicals called serotonin, and dopamine, other neurotransmitters to communicate with each other. So we know how they communicate and uh, how they're mapped. We even know like what the receivers that these neurotransmitters act on in order to cause changes in uh, neuronal activity. So what I studied is how does this worm uh, modulate egg laying behavior? So this worm pretty much lays eggs every two minutes and then it stops for 20 minutes and then it lays eggs for two more minutes and then it stops for 20 minutes. Uh, so what we know in the past is we know what neurons are involved in causing the worm to lay eggs. 
We know what chemicals, serotonin plays a very important role in telling the worm to lay eggs. And then there's another neurotransmitter called tyramine that tells the worm to stop laying eggs. But we never really knew the receivers that these neurotransmitters were acting on in order to tell the egg laying system to start or to stop. We took a green fluorescent protein and we tagged it to that gene of interest. And we just looked under a very fancy confocal microscope and saw, okay, this uh, receptor is expressing these neurons based on green fluorescence that I'm seeing. So that's kind of what I mean by maps. Like uh, I looked at where exactly they are in the different cells of the egg laying circuit by looking at green fluorescence. What's interesting is we even did a couple of uh, functional experiments. By that I mean is what happens when you take away this receptor? H how is egg laying affected? Does it stop? Does it continue? And we ended up kind of like knocking out several different receptors at a time, or we ended up overexpressing. And by that, I mean adding several copies of that receptor to see if it causes uh, uh, an egg laying defect. So one of my students, Kimberly, Kimberly she literally uh, tested every single knockout mutant. They didn't see any defects, unfortunately. And then we got ambitious and I was like, maybe these receptors are redundant for each other. Maybe they're competent for the absence of one. So we ended up knocking out five receptors that were all expressed in a, the same type of cells. And we were hoping to see something, sadly, no. Oh no, that's so much work. Did you do that by, did you do that by mating them with each other and, and selecting, got it. Yes, yes. And uh, but towards the end, I was like, okay, well, why not the opposite? What happens if we have too much of a receptor? And that's actually when we found uh, these egg laying defects. And I said, like, oh, great. Okay, so we found defects when we add too many copies of a receptor, meaning if you have too many copies of a receptor, maybe a lot of neurotransmitters are acting to all of these different receptors, and that's what's causing all these defects. And, uh, and that was pretty much my PhD thesis. Cool. So can you tell me about uh, Scientifico Latino and how... I know that you are a co-founder, so you were involved in the creation. Can you tell me what the organization is and, and how you got involved in it? Sure. So uh, pretty much my first year at, at Yale was not that great. I didn't really see too many people like myself uh, at Yale. Like I, I, I think it was like uh, I was the only Latino in my year and maybe one of three in six years. Wow. So, definitely lots of imposter syndrome like do I belong here like kind of see people like myself uh, is it okay for me to ask for help when no one else is struggling and everyone seems to be on top of it and I kind of didn't want to be like I need help because they're like oh of course you need help so mm. I and uh, I kind of like uh, I didn't do good academically so pretty much my first semester <laughs> I got two C's and I failed a class semester two was like completely different I was like I, I I bothered my TA so many times. I was like, okay, I understand this, but I don't understand this. Can you help me with this? Uh, and when I, we took that class, I ended up doing better. So I kind of like to sum up my time at Yale. Uh, first year, I was like, I don't belong here. My third year, once I passed my qualifying exams and I gave my first oral presentation of my research, I was like, okay, I'm starting to think I belong here. And towards the end, I was like, it's not enough that I belong here, but I need to help others like myself belong here. And that whole experience was kind of like a big motivator for Scientific Latino. I wanted to build a resource uh, of uh, material where anyone can have, even if they don't have a mentor, just because a lot of my time there, I only got to where I got because I had good mentors providing resources. Uh, it's kind of like, okay, great. I am helping a lot of these students at Yale, but I kind of want to expand further. Like how can I use what I learned through my training as a scientist from Michael and helping other underrepresented students at the undergrad level at Yale through STARS, how can I do that more broader? Uh, and that's kind of where Scientific Latino came about. Like I remember I emailed one of my colleagues, uh, Olivia Goldman, who we did a summer research program together at Princeton University over the summer. And then we touched uh, base and I was like, look, uh, this is kind of what I want to do. And at first I was like, let's just list a whole bunch of resources open to the public. Uh, so little by little, uh, Olivia and I worked on developing these resources. We even had a blog series where we highlighted different underrepresented scientists and allies giving advice on different aspects of science uh, or resources in science. So we started this program called GSMI, Grad, School, uh, Grad Student uh, Mentorship Initiative, 
where we help underrepresented, underrepresented students, whether it's unrepresented by ethnicity, sex, gender, disability, et cetera, uh, with their grad school applications in the sciences, whether it's a PhD or a master's program. Uh, and we pair them with a grad student, a postdoc, sometimes even a faculty member who looks over their application. So our program starts ideally over the summer and throughout uh, September to December, they give you feedback on your applications until you submit your application. Cool. Um, so if somebody wants to get like, if, if there's a student who's watching this mm -hmm. and is like, oh, this, that sounds like me, how do they get connected to your resources? Mm -hmm. Oh, so if you go pretty much to the Scientific Latino website and we have different resources at different levels. So if you're a high school student, we have a high school opportunity database where there are a high school uh, research programs that you could do over the summer that they even pay you to do research. At the undergraduate level, if uh, you're interested in summer research programs, we have a whole bunch of programs, different uh, fields. Uh, and also, you know, if you're a DACA undocumented, we have different uh, tags. Uh, in addition to these summer programs, we also have fellowships at the undergraduate level that you could apply for. And if you're thinking of applying to grad school, pretty much here's everything you need to know. Or if you want to transition uh, to a post right before grad school, you know, here's our programs. Well, it's been so much fun learning about you, Rob. Thank you so much for spending time with me today. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.